So I'm really um, honored to be here at Schumacher College. I feel like I'd heard about it so much from its graduates uh, before coming here that it's really nice to actually experience it for myself as part of the uh, teaching of the Right Livelihood course. Um, I think it's a really good time to be talking about Bhutan and I'm really going to do it as a story because I've been kind of in inspired by our day today. We had Martin Shaw, I don't know if many folks here know him, a master storyteller. Uh, talking about the art of storytelling and how it can really convey archetypal stories that come out of a particular place in a particular time. And uh, I love this quote, which he says is not his, but belongs to someone named Sean Kane. <laughs> and the quote is, myth is the power of a place speaking. And there's something about Bhutan as a place that seems to have captured the global imagination. And I don't think it's just because it seems to have certain mystical elements. For example, there are dragons. Uh, the name of the country, Druk, in the local language means dragon. And if you look up the flag of Bhutan, you'll see a dragon emblazoned on, on it. I don't think it's just because it has princesses. In fact, one of the princesses of the royal family is the president of the GNH Center. Nor do I think it has to do with castles, although it does have fortresses and the seat of government in Timpu is a zong, which really looks like a medieval castle. So it has all those mythical elements, but I think it has more to do with the fact that the story of Bhutan is the story of us. And there is a lot in that microcosm of a country that is conducting this very bold national experiment that's relevant to all of us in this time. So I'd like to start a little bit with a story of how I ended up in Bhutan. and how Bhutan has managed to really put happiness and well-being at the heart of their economy and society. I like to tell it in a way that has some personal elements, a little bit about myself, also some global elements, talking about why the United Nations has gotten interested in Bhutan, the political aspects, a little bit about the experience that's coming out of the GNH Center in, and in other parts of the world, and then finally, something about vision, because I think it's important for us to keep our imaginations awake and to envision what, could a, what the future implications might be. So let's start with the personal. That's me in the center in, in Bhutan, but in order to get there, I started out over here in South Africa. As Julie mentioned, I trained at a, as a medical doctor, and I uh, came to South Africa ju just after Nelson Mandela was uh, elected into office, and it was an incredibly hopeful time but it was also a time when um, the HIV epidemic was really starting to escalate out of control. And I was doing a study that was really trying to look at the connection between social living conditions and HIV infection. So if it wasn't biology that was causing HIV to rapidly spread through a country, what was it? And it turns out it had to do a lot with uh, inequality and poverty and, and gender relations and violence that was happening in, in post-apartheid South Africa. So as part of that, I, I went to a small village in the rural northeast where for the first time um, I as a doctor confronted poverty that I hadn't seen on the scale before. So you'll see in that picture, no sources of, of running water, um, really um, dry, um, untillable earth, and children who were often missing meals. And I knew that because I was doing household surveys and I would knock on a door and I would ask, you know, did anyone in this household um, skip a meal today? Uh, when was the last meal that the children had? And what surprised me was not just the level of the poverty that I encountered, but that after, me after doing this household survey, many times the head of the household, who was often a single mother, would ask me if I wanted to stay for a meal and would invite me to sit down with them. And I was shocked by this because I had just heard that they had skipped a meal and there wasn't enough for the children. And I was so touched by this generosity in the midst of material poverty. And I was really sort of struck by the contrast with what you see on the right. I was starting my um, master's degree at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I was jetting between rural South Africa and central London. And I noticed that this was a scene I often saw in the tube. You would get in and nobody would make eye contact with you. Everybody was kind of zoned out and if you uh, ventured a smile, you would often get a strange look in return. And it made me really ask, what is it about the social connections that in this really wealthy, developed country, there's less of a sense of welcome and generosity than I was feeling in South Africa? I was later in, in Manhattan, in New York, um, going between the UN and Bhutan, 
and that's Times Square there. And I was again struck by that, the level of kind of disconnect and the stress that I was seeing in my colleagues, in my friends, compared to the lower level of development by GDP standards in Bhutan, and yet this sense of well-being that I was seeing there. So all this led me to ask some questions that I had, about things I thought I had understood through my training and my education. Questions like, what is development? And is there such a thing as overdevelopment? We talked so much in my training about underdeveloped countries, developing countries, but it made me wonder, have we overshot the mark in some places in terms of what the ideal level of development is? And I asked, where have I been happiest and why? So on the global level, a lot of these questions about development have been asked as well. And you'll, you'll, we've been seeing wave after wave of social unrest passing through various countries. Um, a lot of civil society movements, a lot of protests at the widening inequalities that we're seeing in these developed countries. And a real uh, sharp sense of disillusionment at what has been promised. I don't need to speak to anyone here about the environmental crisis and how that's been playing out across different um, parts of the world. It's really raised an interesting question about the extent of our compassion and our ability to visualize into the future. And the environmental scientists Paul and Ann Ehrlich um, said, can we care enough to take on the cost of changing our own behavior now, knowing it will largely benefit unknown strangers in the future? So again, this idea of can we care enough about future generations in order to make the changes now? And the consequences are being felt. Uh, all of you will know about the World Bank report and the disastrous course to a four degree centigrade temperature rise by the end of the century. What that will mean in terms of the scenarios that we're already starting to see, extreme heat waves, food and water scarcity, and large scale displacement. What we'll start to see are refugees who are fleeing because of reasons related to climate change and resource um, depletion. And no region is going to be immune, but the impacts will be unequal and mostly in the, in the poorest countries, as you might expect. So on the political side, this has started to raise some interesting questions um, about what is development. And it's come at a time where we have very interesting statistics on the wealthy countries, on the developed countries, that are looking at happiness and well-being from that point of view. So we know that wealth does contribute to life satisfaction up to a certain point. But the idea that the further and further you go in terms of wealth, the higher and higher you go in terms of well-being is being disproved by a lot of population-based surveys where you look at well-being. So we know that the United States is one of the richest economies but ranks only 17th in terms of its reported life satisfaction. So what is important if it's not just um, wealth and material growth? When you look at these surveys, it's things like community trust, the extent that you feel like you know your neighbors, good governance, secure work, and work-life balance. Those sorts of things come out consistently across surveys as being really important in terms of increasing well-being. This is a, a graph from um, the spirit level uh, by Wilkinson and Pickett. And they were both members of an expert working group that the government of Bhutan put together to look at the new development paradigm that might be possible. And on, you, on the left axis here, you see an, a composite index of health and social problems, things like life expectancy, math and literacy levels, how many people are in prison, homicides, depression rates, just sort of looking at worst levels here, better levels here. On the horizontal axis is income inequality, what you might see in the Gini coefficient. And what's fascinating is among all of these developed countries, the more unequal the countries are, and on the top right-hand axis there, you have the United States. On the bottom, you have Norway, Sweden, J and Japan. The greater the income inequality, the worse the social and health problems are in these developed countries. So again, interesting evidence that's showing that among wealthy countries, inequality is bad uh, uh, in terms of these outcomes. So that's led to a really serious interrogation of GDP. And um, in the United Nations, that led to the invitation um, to Bhutan um, of the Prime Minister to speak about GDP. This followed on an interesting report put together um, by Stiglitz, Sen, and Fatuzzi looking at mismeasuring our lives. What is it that GDP is measuring? What is it missing? 
Um, and I'll show you a video that will convey some of these um, um, challenges. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Specs knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. So what is astonishing is that footage comes from 1968, when Robert Kennedy was raising the problems with uh, GDP. And it's as relevant now and is being taken up um, much more seriously in other countries. So when Bhutan did come to the UN um, to speak about gross national happiness, it really attracted um, over 800 participants. The UN Secretary, Secretary General was opening the meeting, the President of Costa Rica. And what's interesting was activists across a whole range of uh, different areas of people who are representing religious leaders, environmentalists, people who are looking at poverty, indigenous rights. A lot of different groups were seeing the importance of looking at what is at the center of our development paradigm. And it was really putting forward the idea that we can't just be tinkering at the edges of the current model that may um, support things or change things slightly, but we need to really look at the fundamental causes of what's driving the problems. And the International Expert Working Group was put together by the Prime Minister of Bhutan to really see how can we take these issues to a broader audience? How can we translate the experience of Bhutan to a broader audience? So I'm going to talk a little bit now about GNH. Um, how many people here are familiar with the nine domains of GNH? A few tentative hands. <laughs> a few more. OK. So GNH is really um, gross national happiness, is really a holistic development strategy that's saying that a number of elements are important in measuring a country's prosperity and well-being. There are a few things in there that are probably familiar to people um, that include living standards and health and education, but there are a few new ones that may be of surprise to people. What's interesting is that, um, OK, I'll show you a few. Um, time use is one, cultural diversity and resilience. Um, ecological diversity, community vitality. These are the sorts of things that are being measured in Bhutan. And it's really looking at, at happiness and well-being as having economic, social, political, and spiritual dimensions. Um, it's used as a survey. So there's a GNH index, which measures these nine domains and 33 indicators. And it's conducted as a survey every three years in order to see where the country is doing and in order to guide policy making. And that's an important element as well, that it's used as a policy screening tool by the GNH Commission in order to decide how the government should, should steer its development. 
And it's really also a shift in mindset from economic growth at all costs to asking questions like what kind of growth is important and what is a sustainable and sufficient amount of growth. So I think it's important to say that Bhutan is not claiming to have all the answers. It sees it very much as a living experiment as well, a kind of a national laboratory where they are really trying to live to these aspirations. And I think when the group comes to Bhutan in March, they'll be seeing how it's actually being implemented and some of the challenges that come up in that context. Has anyone here um, had the opportunity to, to visit Bhutan? No, not one. We'll see a few more hands. <coughs> oh, hi, and, and Julie. Yeah. I think when we ask this question again in July, we'll see quite a few more hands going up. Um, I think that Bhutan is not immune to the kinds of materialist temptations. It's been opening up to television and advertising and tourism as well. And also, as one of the ministers has said, you know, we can't be a GNH bubble in a GDP world. There's a lot of interdependence between what's happening in Bhutan and what's happening elsewhere. So I want to look a little bit at um, one of the domains which isn't really measured in uh, GDP at all, but seems to be really important to people in, in surveys of well-being, and that's time use. So I think um, Mahatma Gandhi uh, put it really well when he said there's more to life than simply increasing its speed. I think most of us can relate to work-life balance and the sense of speediness that's come into our lives. I think a, a nice way of uh, looking at this is this uh, photo, which is a fav favorite of mine here. It's by Louis Daguerre in 1838. It's the first photo of a human being that was ever taken. Can anybody see the human being in that photo? Maybe we need to make it a little bit larger. There you go. So you could, under, you could ask yourself, why was there just one uh, person standing in this busy street, street corner in Paris in, in the 1800s? Was there a plague? Was there a strike? What was going on? Any ideas? Lunchtime. <laughs> no, that's, that's Schumacher College. <laughs> no, it was deserted because of the exposure time. This first photograph took 10 minutes, and the only person who was standing still long enough to be captured was this man who was having his shoes shined. So it's to me, raises a really interesting point about what actually lasts, what actually gets captured, and what are we losing in the speediness of our buzzing around from meeting to meeting. So satisfaction with time use is a really strong predictor of well-being across countries. And when you ask people, they say lack of leisure time, lack of being able to spend time with their kids is a real source of stress for people. Uh, free time, which is um, one of the ironies, though, is that free time is increasingly devoted to watching television in de developed countries. And a, a really striking figure um, from Kaiser's research, Kaiser Family Foundation's research in the United States, was that children ages 8 to 18 spend about eight and a half hours a day watching TV or using digital devices. Eight and a half hours a day. And that's more time than they spend on any other activity except sleeping. So you could, we had an interesting conversation at lunchtime about what is the impact of that on children, on their ability to concentrate, on their time spent out in nature. And um, when I was doing this report for the UN, looking at the impacts on health, I delved into the pediatric literature to see what is the impact of long TV watching on children. And it's things like you might expect, higher obesity, lower sleep, but also interesting ones like fewer social ties, low concentration, higher materialism, and an increase in upwards social comparison. Can anyone guess what that is? Upward social comparison. Exactly. So comparing yourself to uh, other kids, looking at what they have, and, and feeling inferior as a result of that. Um, I think it's no coincidence that in the past decade, the use of prescription drugs to treat ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children, has increased by 46% in the United States and has quadrupled in the UK. 
So we were talking about this at, at lunch as well. You know, what is the impact of children on these hyper-stimulated, um, um, very busy lives that they're leading, that their parents are leaving, and, and not being in nature, not having um, more time. So time use is measured in the GNH survey. Community vitality is also um, very important in Bhutan. You'll see there at the top left a picture of a setu or a local festival. And if we're lucky, we'll see one in Bhutan. This is not something that people attend just to be entertained and, and buy tickets for. It's actually people travel far distances from rural areas to participate and see these local dances and local songs. And it's a real bonding of communities. Um, in many places, we've lost that. Um, and, and a lot of studies are showing that this sense of community is actually one of the most important determinants of people's well-being. And yet it's beginning to be, be eroded by the growing inequalities, the urbanization that we're seeing in many parts of the world, and also some tragedies that we've been seeing in the United States and elsewhere, um, where sudden violence, um, like the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, that really shook people up and made them wonder what is happening to our sense of community. So psychological well-being is also measured in the GNH survey. Um, I think it's um, really worrisome that depression now ranks the first as a contributor to the burden of de disease in high and middle income countries. So again, the, the impact on our economies, the impact on our well-being is really um, 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 something to be of concern. In Bhutan, there are limits on public advertising. When you come to Bhutan, you will not see lots of billboards. You won't see Coca-Cola signs plastered all over the place. They're really trying to limit that kind of advertising in the country. And what's interesting is that the capacity for happiness is not seen as something that is fixed, but rather something that be can, can be cultivated and nourished. So um, children are, are meditating in school. Um, there's a real sense that altruism and connection to one another is really important to, to um, sort of bring into young kids from an early age. I think some of us are probably aware of the recent research on meditation and compassion um, that neuroscientists have been undertaking. People like the Mind and Life Institute, where they've been hooking up um, long-time meditators to functional MRI scanners and actually finding neuroplasticity, that the, the neuronal connections in the brain that are associated with compassion actually start to increase and strengthen with uh, repeated use through training, through meditation. So I want to close by talking a little bit about vision, and I'll show um, a couple of video clips that will give you a sense of what the GNH Center is doing in Bhutan, some of the programs that we're trying to design in order to link um, this philosophy and the strategy of measuring progress to what's really happening on the ground. One of them um, was really a collaboration between the GNH Center, the Presencing Institute, and the German Federal Ministry of Development. And it was really to try and look at how we can bring this idea of new measurement, new indicators to other countries, to other decision makers. Is it possible to look at other ways of measuring progress um, beyond Bhutan? <coughs> and it's a, about a 10 minute video. One of the key dimensions of um, how the old economy works is the uh, uh, orientation and fixation to improving GDP, although we know from statistics that more GDP does not translate in developed countries to more well-being. Beyond GDP, to some extent, conveys the idea that material development is important up to a point. But beyond that point, we need to look at other indicators and other measures of well-being. Well, I think it's really talking about changing our economy from something that serves just a few to something that serves the many. Being able to have these discussions about the challenges between happiness and progress and prosperity, I think that'll be really, really helpful. I'm excited to work with other people around the idea of well, what's a better way to do business.
The Global Wellbeing and GNH Lab is a project in which we're working with an international group of 25 participants who've been selected because they're all in some way working on global well-being. And what we're doing is taking them together to really interesting high potential areas for innovation, such as Brazil and Bhutan, and giving them a lot of support and space for them to reflect and then prototype, innovate new projects and new ideas when they go back home. If this is a tiny little microcosm of how to do things differently, I think that will be a, a hell of a spark for the future. What the lab is trying to do is say, let's take people out of their normal environment, their comfort zones, take them to places where they can be inspired or challenged or provoked, where they can connect with like-minded people, and where they can see things in a way that they haven't before. A lot of the first part of the journey is about sensing, taking in what's out there, not coming there with your answers, with your preconceived notion of what you're going to see and go, aha, uh -huh, okay, check, 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 that's what I expected. But rather to really go there with an open mind. We took our time to be in the community, to walk around, to engage with very different levels of the community, from the police to local inhabitants to civil society people who were trying to bring about change. What was surprising was the inspiration. So we saw entrepreneurs, we saw a community that was trying to deal with gang violence and crime and come up with unconventional solutions to that. So we experienced the urbanization, the tensions in, in these uh, very unequal societies, and then we radically and very quickly moved into the Amazon. We had amazing conversations there where people were able to share the kind of work that they were doing and what they were hoping to see come out of the lab. We have to have the corporate social responsibility trying to change the system from within while we have people creating different models that drive the market to say, we're going to choose that if you guys don't change. When we stepped off the boat, we got to meet people in communities uh, that were working to really live in balance with nature and engage with the modern world in a way that preserved their values and their indigenous knowledge. Being with the communities that lived on the river, the sense of deep and profound relationship between people and nature was very important to see. Both the ability to work with the natural environment to produce goods or to sustain livelihoods but also the sense of how that held community ways of being that seemed to be essentially sustainable. An appreciation started to emerge about what makes a community that is well. Money per se, was, we found, was not the primary driver for happiness and well-being. A lot of our sessions in the mornings involved people sitting with a practice of mindfulness or meditation just to resist the urge to constantly fill the space up with ideas and thoughts. Mindfulness is about reclaiming the power of our attention and directing it intentionally so that our attention is aligned with our intentions. What we measure is what we are attentive to therefore the importance of the indicators. If we shift what we measure, we become aware and attentive to other things, and therefore there can be a system shift. I think for a lot of people, just being taken to some really challenging and also inspiring parts of Brazil opened up their thinking about their own work in a way that uh, they hadn't anticipated to come back with fresh perspective and with maybe some courage and some inspiration to do something differently. And I think that's what we started to see happening in Brazil. There are many attempts to develop new ways to measure progress and development, but the only country in the world who's trying to do it on a country-wide level is Bhutan.
It's a unique opportunity to observe what are the challenges, what work, what doesn't work. So in a way, although it's a very small country, what's happening here is very important because it is some kind of a, an experiment the rest of the world can learn from. Within Bhutan, uh, the government has really been promoting gross national happiness as a way of measuring how the country is doing, um, not just in relation to uh, economic growth, which is what GDP would reflect, but how the, the nation as a whole is doing in terms of well-being and happiness. The second half of the lab brought all the participants to Bhutan for a deep immersion experience in GNH. So we started off with a welcoming and a ceremonial tree planting and we were really lucky uh, to have uh, Her Royal Highness Ashi Kezan Wangchuk to open and welcome us here. Bhutan seeks to balance equitable and sustainable economic development with environmental conservation, cultural promotion and good governance. This is why we welcome the opportunity to work with distinguished global leaders and thinkers such as you. We then had a series of speakers from the government and policy level. When the Prime Minister talks about Bhutan's leadership role in developing this new economic paradigm or new development paradigm, he very often uses the term, he says, it has a purpose. And its purpose is human happiness and the well-being of all life forms. We have trained all our school leaders and deputy school leaders in um, infusing ideas of gross national happiness into the overall life of the school. Then it was going to the field and visiting a number of institutions, civil society organizations, to see the way it's implemented on the ground level. We opted to reduce plastic waste by refusing to eat packaged food on all days except Wednesday. We had been exposed more to the outer side of GNH, policy making and uh, its implementation in the country. And now we wanted to, to encourage the participant to reflect what does it mean for them personally in terms of values, in terms of life's purpose, meaning. So we organized this uh, walking pilgrimage to Tiger's Nest, which is one of the sacred places in Bhutan. The pilgrimage is always at the same time an outer journey to a physical place in space, but always also an inner journey. Find that spot that'll be a little off the path where you can be without walking and panting, but where you can actually be and settle. That question of inner transformation, I think, is central to the journey uh, of this lab, to really understand what is it that we need to shift in ourselves how do we model that or inspire it for others? And then how can that become a movement for social change? One of the explicit goals of the Global Wellbeing and GNH Lab is to create living examples of how we can actually model this change in the world. And that's based on the idea that we need to prototype, we need to try out new things, revise them, go back to the drawing board, and then start to see how they can be scaled up. Prototyping ideas may be an advancement of a piece of work that we're already doing. For others, kind of it's taking an idea that we had already and move them into action in order to use them as an instrument for institutional and uh, system-wide transformation. This isn't built on GDP, it's a it's an absolutely stark challenge to GDP. This is actually proving mm. that GDP doesn't work for yeah. the people. <laughs> we want to specifically focus on the business engagement because it's been really missing from our work so far. Our prototype is essentially to engage business leaders with this purpose, to change the way we frame and conduct our economy from us versus them to a business value proposition which builds community by better serving society and nature and engaging the creativity and potential of all citizens. A number of exciting projects have come out of this lab. They're early seeds, they'll need to be fertilized and watered and looked after. But they're quite creative and they've brought together new partnerships to really deal with these issues in a new way. On the last day, it felt like as if we were playing a symphony together and all these different instruments had come in a certain harmony. 
we have really come to some concrete ideas for how to ground going beyond GDP in real practical projects. All these leaders and change agents go back to Brazil, the US, uh, India, wherever they are situated and there they work um, and, and do action with what they have come up with in the lab so, and in the process so far. It's given me a sense of strength, a sense of motivation to keep going forward and most excitingly it's given me this amazing new network of wonderful friends and colleagues and peers who I'm really looking forward to working with in the future. It's made me realize that true system transformation really starts with individuals, that, that the ability to transform the economy or transform our healthcare system ultimately depends on the ability and willingness of the individuals within the system to transform themselves. I still feel that from this lab, we, we human beings, we still have a hope for the future. That is what I came to know. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of um, the kinds of experiments and the kind of programs that we're trying to run in the GNH Center um, and really trying to bring international groups there together to learn. Some of the groups that you saw there, uh, Governor Kitzhaber and Sylvia Hayes, First Lady of Oregon, are applying new measures of progress, as you heard in the, in the film, the G Genuine Progress Indicator, or GPI, in Oregon. And they've been working closely with Lou Daly, who was also in the lab from Demos, which is a think tank in the US. Um, they held a national summit for GPI in the states uh, with delegations from 20 different states also looking at measuring progress differently. And it was interesting speaking to them because they felt that actually trying to shift things on a national level in the United States was impossible. Just it was so horns locked between the political parties, but that change could happen on the state level at a smaller scale and collectively things could start to move forward. Um, Eileen Fisher, um, people might know from the fashion label, Eileen Fisher Clothing. Uh, so she was the founder um, there and she's been really trying to link this idea of inner transformation and social change, um, both at a personal level with her staff. So she set up a center for those who are working for Eileen Fisher to begin to spend more time looking after their own well-being, being able to do things like yoga and meditation, but also looking at her supply chain and looking at, uh, at the degree to which um, that sort of environmental and social consciousness is woven right through their entire supply chain. Michelle Long has been um, leading this organization called BALI, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. Some people here may know of it, but a similar approach and philosophy to what I've been seeing here in the transition towns, really trying to localize economies and build networks that are much more um, working together. Um, one of the projects that Julie mentioned is really trying to look at education and how we can bring, bring these values of compassion and cooperation into the schools because if kids are, are being educated in a system that's really competitive and, and shifting them towards fitting into the job market, how are we going to see um, that change coming into the future? It's interesting that um, earlier views of education really um, grew out of monasteries and cathedral schools where the contemplative practices, moral instruction and liberal arts were seen as part of a holistic education. We've largely forgotten that because now the shift to education has really been focusing increasingly on, on the hard sciences and we're seeing the ethics, arts um, being dropped in a lot of schools, including even primary schools, early schools. Um, obviously Schumacher College and the vision that we see here and that we're living here is in sharp contrast to that, but it's not what's, what we're seeing in, in, other parts, um, in other parts of this country and internationally. And this, and this focus on test scores and getting kids and schools to pass test scores is really changing um, the way education is happening. So one of our projects with the Mind and Life Institute is really collaborating to see whether we can bring what people are calling social and emotional learning, but it's basically human values and ethics and into the classroom from primary school up to high school levels. Um, and to really see whether we can refocus education more to serve society and planet rather than the market. So Bhutan is starting to um, work with some primary and high schools um, on this education <coughs> curriculum and we'll also be doing some work in Vietnam. Um, so finally, I think a lot of the focus that we've been having, even in this Right Livelihood course, has been the connection between inner transformation and social change. Um, I think it's really interesting that that's been um, 
sort of reflected in, in some of the statements from Al Albert Einstein. Some of you may be familiar with, but the one I love is, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking, which really reflects the statement from the Buddha, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts, with our thoughts we make the world such a stark difference in terms of the times and the context, but really saying that the reality that we create really starts with the inner condition of our mind. And I think one of the frustrations I had working in the UN system was our tendency to focus outwardly, constantly looking for technical solutions to complex problems, but without looking at the inner conditions of the people who are creating the policies and solutions. Um, and we had an interesting program recently looking at the spiritual dimensions across a number of different religious um, traditions. Uh, Vandana Shiva, Charles Eisenstein, Sister Jayanti, some names that may be familiar to, to you, came to Bhutan to explore that. And then finally, I wanted to share this quote with our, um, the former Prime Minister of Bhutan, who is um, now uh, the chairman of the GNH Center, about the kinds of graduates that he would envision what we want to see is nothing less than transformative graduates who are genuine human beings realizing their full and true potential, caring for others, including other species, ecologically literate, contemplative, as well as analytical in their understanding of the world, appreciating completely that they're not separate from the natural world and from others, in some manifesting their humanity fully. So really a, a much broader vision of what education could be and what the GNH Center's role should be. And I think we've taken some bold steps in that direction in this new collaboration with Schumacher, Schumacher College. Some folks in this room may recognize themselves in, in this picture. Um, but it's really, uh, for those who are, are, are uh, new to this program, it's three modules that will be happening over a year. Um, the first class is here, most of who are in this room. We'll then be going to Bhutan in March uh, to do uh, an exp another experience and a, a deep dive into the Bhutan experience and then coming back here to Schumacher College, really exploring this question of right livelihood. So I'd like to end um, by just showing a short video clip that I think really captures how the shift in mindset that may seem so huge can be quite simple sometimes and quite radical in how we see our future. I am part of a lost generation and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize this may be a shock, but happiness comes from within is a lie and money will make me happy. So in 30 years I will tell my children they are not the most important thing in my life. My employer will know that I have my priorities straight because work is more important than family. I tell you this, once upon a time families stayed together. But this will not be true in my era. This is a quick fix society. Experts tell me 30 years from now I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that I will live in a country of my own making. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. No longer can it be said that my peers and I care about this earth. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that there is hope. And all of this will come true unless we choose to reverse it. There is hope. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. No longer can it be said that environmental destruction will be the norm. In the future, I will live in a country of my own making. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. Experts tell me this is a quick fix society, but this will not be true in my era. Families stayed together once upon a time. I tell you this. Family is more important than work. I have my priorities straight because my employer will know that they are not the most important thing in my life. So in 30 years, I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie, and true happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the world, and I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation.